So right, chapter four, subsetting. Um, I mean, we've all pretty much, I mean, we all I know have used R, so subsetting shouldn't necessarily be uh, anything um, you know, surprising to us, but you know, it, I think it was a good chapter kind of at least cleared up some stuff for me um, because there are some like, there is some like weirdness and like, especially like base R subsetting um, that can at least, you know, sometimes throw you off and uh, you no, know, it sometimes throws me off when I'm uh, working with R. So we are going to be talking about, um, I just call these brackets. I don't know if there is a special name for them, uh, but, you know, we're going to talk about uh, the single bracket and how to use that when we're subsetting, uh, you know, vectors, lists, matrices, and data frames. And then we're going to be talking about its related analogs, the double brackets, and our friend, the dollar sign, um, and how um, these have some interesting um, side effects in terms of um, the structure of the you know, data structure you're working with and how it might may or may not simplify it. Um, we're going to talk about sub assignment and uh, we're going to relate some how to use like subsetting to like some common applications um, in data analysis. So cool, let's get to it. Um, so with atomic vectors, there are just six ways that we can uh, subset an atomic vector. Um, so we can do it with positive integers like this. Um, so, you know, just selecting the uh, values at, um, Jesus, uh, <laughs> indices three and one, uh, negative integers, what they do is uh, they um, drop those, drop the values at those indices. Uh, we can also do with logical vectors. The, the, I guess you, I don't see why you would ever do this, but I think it sometimes is a bit clearer it's what happening if you do something like, you know, X and then you subset it and then do, I want all the values that are greater than three in this vector X, um, because that's like essentially right under the hood what's happening here. Um, although, yeah, you never write this, but that's, you know, good, um, good way just to see what's happening under the hood. Uh, nothing. This is a, this is actually, I guess, a bit interesting. I've personally never used this. I'm um, like, I've seen in the book before because I've like tried to go through this book <laughs> many times um, and always stop at like the functional programming section. But I've like seen this. I have personally never, um, again, used it, but there is like an interesting application how, um, you know, we'll get to it a little bit later where you essentially use this and you want to maybe like apply some manipulation right to the data frame or like really just any sort of like object you're working with. Um, you can essentially keep that existing structure um, without like changing it. And we'll get to that a bit later. Um, indexing of zero. I also can't really think of any applications um, with this, but you know, you just index a vector with zero and you get, you get an empty vector of just uh, with numeric of zero. Um, not sure if anyone here has used that or has found a need to, but you can yeah, do it in R. I, oh, yep. I think, um, well, there are sometimes like when you're running a function or something where you want to like, I, I've done, I do this a lot where I run a bunch of univariable or univariate regression models on a bunch of different predictors. And I want to like create a table where I like stack each row of, mm -hmm. um, on like into a data frame. And so I think you have to, to do that. I remember. You have to create like an empty data frame, but I guess that's not the same thing. Sorry, I don't know why I'm even. <laughs> no, it's all, no, it's all good. I mean, I'm just trying to. I, I would have to check back in the books. I feel like they might have mentioned something, but I yeah, because I feel like right, you just do like if I was want like empty data frame, I just do that. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> and character vectors, right? So um, this is, I guess, kind of some of the weirdness I. Maybe I'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, this kind of reminds me even of like how you can kind of work with lists, right? Um, when you're like selecting elements, um, you can also now have like named vectors, right? So you can have something uh, like a vector Y, right? Which now just has these names, D, C, and A with these values and you can select them. Um, you know, I, I want all of, I want these, um, I want all the values for D, C, and A. I can just select it by the name. Um, in that character vector. So also like kind of similar to, you know, maybe how you'd select names in, um, in like a data frame as an example. Um, with lists, pretty much all of the stuff that we talked about above that uh, works with atomic vectors, works with lists. Um, we're gonna get to a little bit more. There are again, the double bracket and the dollar sign that, um, you know, apply to lists that don't apply to the atomic vectors. Um, and with matrices, it's also very similar, right? Um, but in this case, we now have two dimensions, right? We have rows and columns. So as an example, here we have some matrix A um, that just has you know, the numbers one through nine, so a three by three matrix. 
Um, we then give it some column names. And in this case, I'm asking for the uh, first and third rows and the um, columns B and A, right? So in this case, right, I'm just um, subsetting based off of the rows um, and also based off of the columns, right? And obviously in this case, I could do something like, you know, A, like C, um, whatever, right, the integers, right? It's like one, three, and then like this, right? I can get, you know, the same type of deal um, if I wanted to do like that. Hey, uh, can I interrupt just to, just before we go too far, because you're kind of, I see where you are on in the book, but one thing that I thought was really kind of funny and interesting was at the bottom of, I guess it's, um, well, it's right before you get to list, but it's on the bottom of page 76, but they're like, um, factors are not treated specially when subsetting means that subsetting will, you know, so basically, you know, we all know, hopefully, I think we all know that factors are both numbers and char typically character strings. And so you're subsetting based on the integer or the integer vector that's underlying that. And so I just love how they finish or he finishes this. This typically is unexpected. So you should avoid subsetting with factors. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's, that's something I'm going to talk about. I didn't, I guess, focus as much on it with factors. Um, there are some like, and I guess we'll also especially guess to like with the, uh, the dollar operator, there are just like some weird things with subsetting um, that to yeah. me don't make as much sense um, from like a, like a design perspective. They're just like some weird gotchas that, mm -hmm. um, that like don't necessarily like, at least for me, didn't like map as neatly. Um, but, mm -hmm. but I agree with what you're saying. Like there are like some weird warnings where it's like, oh, you should totally do this like instead, right? Like this is a better way, but it's like, why does it even exist in the language? Yeah, I guess that, that was what was funny was like, they don't even really offer. So I guess, but I guess, you know, I guess what I inferred was, I mean, so if you look at the example, they're like subsetting where they like, name you know the letter b a factor and then they subset you know um based on that so i guess the alternative would be just like don't make it a factor just leave it as a character string yeah that's pretty much what they said um or I or i guess you could like you know do some kind of case one thing where you create like or i mean i guess they're already created implicitly but you could there's some ways that you could extract the the, the, the numeric values that are associated with i don't know it just seems like a weird but anyway but yeah it just goes it's so funny like this the, the community has had always such an issue with factors i mean going back to what is it like you know um what's the one thing everyone hates about factors as you know characters character strings as factors you know that was like the big hatred thing for like 10 years it seems like until they, they got rid of it in the last like five years i guess but anyway yeah no yeah no i agree some weird some weird gotchas <laughs> um so yeah getting back to it um we have a single bracket right so what's weird about this is that this will always return the simplest dimensionality when you're doing indexing so you know again we have our matrix a right it looks like this if i want the first row um it'll just give me, right, that as a vector. Um, and, but in this, well, actually, I guess, mm, no, I mean, that's still a vector, right? Sorry. Okay. I guess that's an integer. And then, well, no, it'd be, is it class? It would be an integer atomic vector. Yeah. Right? So class, and then, Is it attributes? Uh, attributes A1. No, that doesn't make any sense. Instead um, of doing type of, can you do type? Can you just do type? Oh, yeah, type and then A1. Has anyone ever used an array before? Is that a curiosity? No. <laughs> I feel like the array is like the ultimate like thing we talk about but never actually do thing, you know, unless you do like, I don't know, I know people that do genetics and, you know, they, they have like these massive. Oh. You know, multi-dimensional like matrices or whatever, but I don't know. I've yeah, it's never... a named int. Yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never used arrays. Like when I first got introduced to this book, like when you, when I read arrays, like it just went over my head because I never use them. So yeah, mm. same. Um. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'll get more to like where I have this simplifies, right? I don't really think it does so in this example. Um. Arrays, which I'm just going to briefly mention, right? They're stored in column major order. So um, 
you can like subset it right with like a vector like this with like four and 15. This gave, I was looking at the output, I'm like, this makes no sense. And then I reread it and it was like, oh, it's in column major order because matrices in R start in row major order. So that like threw me off for a second. So as to like why um, uh, I was like getting, if I look at fouls, right? Um, I'm like, why am I getting this? <laughs> and, and like, why am I getting these two values? Like, this makes no sense. Um, and then it's like, oh, wait, no, it's in column major order. So then once I found that out, that result made right. sense to me. That doesn't, that doesn't, why, but why do it that way? I guess that's, that's the question. Like, why make it different? I don't know. I, I, don't like I, it. I think it's like, depending, like, Ron, I feel like you might know this, but like, I think, um, it, it might have to do like depending on like the computation you're running and depending on like the form it's stored in it might just be faster right to like either do that computation like column wise or row wise i could totally be wrong but i, I feel like it's something related thing, to that only thing i can think of is if fortran for some reason uses column wise instead or one of the it uses the opposite convention that no one else uses so since a lot of these libraries deep down are still Fortran libraries and people are using Limpack and all that stuff, that might be why. Yeah. So I, in I'm, other words, you might run into data that's stored the other way that came from mm -hmm. something like that. I'm like trying to think, of, think like, of. I'm trying to think about it with like databases, right? Because it's like they're obviously like columnar data, you know, databases out, out in the wild, um, and they're also row ones. So, uh, I guess I don't fully know. Honestly, that might be that might be a Google um, after yeah. this. Yeah. Um, anyway, we can also, or, oh, yep. Or just forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just let that one go. True. I'm like, I, I have enough things to think about. Just, that's fine. Yeah. Wait till, wait till we have that big job that requires a raise. raise <laughs> no, that. I know that I'm going to be, I'm going to be yelling. I'm going to be like, damn it. If only I looked this up. <laughs> yeah. No, you would have probably forgotten again by now. Yeah. Also true. <laughs> Good. I know this is I know this is off topic, but I remember we had that like first question like early at the start where like I can't remember what it was like it was like the memory address and like we had that kind of big conversation about it and then it got posted to Twitter yeah and then like Hadley started answering to it and it got to the point where Hadley's like yeah uh, I don't know if this is really going to be useful in your day to day yeah. like, you're probably right but anyways <laughs> that's just a sidebar no I agree <laughs> um. You can also use matrices to select into arrays, right? So in this case, um, I, you know, with, like with these court, this matrix with these coordinates, right? I can then select from this array uh, those coordinates, and I get back this. Um, so yeah, kind of cool. You can you know mix and match. Um, there are like different ways to like subset, right? Different objects. Um, you can kind of use more like arbitrary and like complicated structures um, to get the data that you want. Um, now we get to you know the powerhouse. I think everyone everyone has used I've used these uh, data frames and tibbles. Um, so when we use the single brackets on a data frame, there are um, two ways we can do it. We can use uh, what you know list like indexing. Um, so in this case, uh, if we you know subset into a data frame um, called DF and we want to do one uh, colon three, that returns a data frame with the first three columns, which to me seems weird. Um, maybe because I've been I feel like in I want to say I'm like pandas that actually, does that return rows? I don't know. To, to me, like this just looks, this just looks bizarre a little bit. Um, Cause at least my brain goes to like, this should be rows. Um, obviously like I know this will obviously return rows, right? Cause it'd be, you know, row and then this column when you add a <laughs> comma. Um, but I don't know, th th this to me, like seems like it should be the first three rows. Um, but it isn't, right? This just returns the first three columns. Um, and then you can obviously index on two dimensions. In this case, I'm saying I want uh, the first three rows of this data frame uh, along with all of the columns. Um, yeah, so, you know, pretty easy. Um, and we can also do like, right, this, the same types of like subsetting we were doing above with, um, with vectors. I can ask to uh, return the first and third, third rows of this data frame like this. Um, I can also, since this data frame also has obviously columns um, and really data frames are just lists of vectors, I can then say, hey, I want the columns uh, X and Z, right? And all of the rows. And I can just do it like that, right? 
pretty simple. Um, like I also, I guess even maybe I should have also written the tidyverse one analogs for this, but I did it for some of them. Maybe I should have done it here, but I think we all know how to select like these rows, right? Using the tidyverse or like these columns. Um, and arguably that's a bit more like eloquent when um, you're doing a data analysis. Um, this is where you kind of get like the weirdness with uh, single brackets. Um, so with this one, if we just say, hey, I want this column um, and I'm not indexing on any of the dimensions, this will return a data frame with, um, with a column X. Um, and you know, we, we could you know, verify that's the case by just looking at structure, right? It's a data frame. Now, if I want, um, now if I index saying, hey, I want this data frame and I want all the rows and I want uh, the column X, well, that now returns a vector, right? So, you know, validate that really quick. Um, and, you know, see, right, it's just a numeric, um, well, I guess an integer vector um, with um, values one, two, and three. So there's like, you know, some weird gotchas. We, there are ways obviously to get around that. Um, I'm gonna get to a little bit, but just something to be aware of. Um, that uh, single brackets will try to um, reduce the dimensionality of whatever object you're working with to the simplest it can be, um, which again, kind of is to me a bit weird, um, but you know, that's R, <laughs> um, which is also kind of where tibbles come in. So with, when you're working with tibbles, anytime you're using uh, any of these types of like subsetting operations, um, I think besides dollar, it will always return a, uh, it will always return a tibble. So if I subset, um, you know, we have our little tibble here with the same type of data, um, which we, you know, you can see right there. If I want to say, hey, I want the column X, that'll return a tibble with column X, right? And if I do the other way that we know uh, simplifies um, essentially this indexing, right, that we apply to just a regular data frame, we apply it to a tibble, it still returns a tibble. Uh, and, and you know, the deep higher way of selecting stuff, right, is usually just using the select uh, function um, because I didn't include deep plier, that's funny. Uh, and uh, pull, I've used this a handful of times sometimes when I just like want a vector of data, I do find it kind of useful. Um, so let's say you just need your column as a vector, right? You do not want it as a table. You can just use the pull function. It's pretty neat, just does that. Um, pull is like very similar to if I just wanted to say, hey, I want, um, X from this data frame, right? And it'll return just a vector. Um, but obviously, you know, you can use that when, let's say I'm performing some operations and maybe I need to like, after I do all those operations, I need to like select the column, but I want it as a vector and I just want to keep it in my, my, uh, my pipe. So I can just do that. Um, any questions so far or everything, everyone good? I guess like, I guess my question is because it's, it's interesting to me when you say like, when you look at like the, the subsetting with like the colon notation mm -hmm. in it, like how that's confusing. Is that because like in Python, there's like additional syntax that you can add to it that like does like slicing and all that stuff. Like that's what, cause like when you, like when you said that it was like interesting to you, I was just like, oh, this is common to me. Like you're going to get columns back. But then like, I was thinking about it, like learning about like the other like indexing, slicing, and, and subsetting syntax or Python, there's so much more you can do with kind of like that, the brackets and the columns, but. Yeah, I'm pretty, actually, wait, this is a Quora document, right? So actually, can I just do, I can actually just test that. Actually, well, let me see if this will work <laughs> or if I'm just gonna like break something. Huh? I don't know. I was just curious about it because like, cause I'm just like, I mainly, you know, work in R. So I'm just like, Oh, that just makes sense to me. But I'm just like wondering from the perspective of somebody else, like why that might be the case. Yeah. Here let's, um, let's I think Pandas this. is a little weird. And I think he's right. And that if you did just a single bracket and a number, you actually get the first row. And yep. I think a lot. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, you get rows. And, but if, I remember reading somewhere, I think it might've been that, um, I can't remember. Really anyway, a book on pandas. Somebody was saying that was kind of a design error because normally if you do a single bracket after a data frame, it's for picking columns. So it's, but if you put the integers, you get rows instead. So that it's really where pandas is kind of weird. <laughs> in my view. Yeah. It, it might also just be like, I've been using Python way more. So then maybe yeah. my brain is just like fitting towards that. Um, but I've seen people recommend don't to do, don't do that. Don't do DF one to three, only use iLoke instead. Just 
Um, yeah. That way it's, it's always clear what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, there is some weirdness in pandas. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know. Yeah. That's in all, me, I in guess. all fairness, panda is also weird in its own way. So. Yeah. <laughs> I guess this was just like weird to me, but it's also like one of those things that's like, oh, you just remember that, right? Um, yeah. Like, I think kind of like with anything. But yeah. Hmm. So anyway, we're going to get to now preserving dimensionality. So we saw with, right, with single brackets, um, depending on the object you're working with and how you're indexing into it. Um, it will um, essentially simplify that object, whatever the simplest form it is. Um, so in this case, you know, we have our matrix. And if I want, just want the first row of this matrix, um, but let's say I just, I want this actually returned as a matrix for whatever reason, um, you just add in the drop equals false. Uh, you set drop, which is keyword um, within uh, the brackets, um, set it to false and you get a matrix. Um, so, I mean, this is definitely a lot more useful for, I would imagine, you know, like for like data frame stuff, especially if like you have some sort of like function um, and you're taking in some data frame, right? Maybe you're doing some subsetting um, on it and you want to just like preserve it as a data frame for some, you know, sort of like downstream application or whatnot. Um, you can like add in that keyword or you can just use tibbles and that, you know, kind of gets away from all of this, like remembering uh, some of like the weirdness of base R. Um, and then we have factors. So we do have, uh, you know, we have a factor here, Z, uh, with, you know, levels A and B. And let's say, oh, I want the first element. Um, I think it's, what, what it, oh yeah, it's um, it, it, like, right, 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 you were saying this, Ryan, where it's like, it converts, it, it's like looking at, okay, what is this actually like? It's converting to like an integer representation. So it's like subsetting with factors essentially what I've got from this is that you really should just never do that um, because it's not going to return the results um, that you're expecting. Um, so yeah, don't, don't really subset with factors. Um, yeah, at least um, if you, I mean, I guess the, you know, you just make, make it a character if you can, I guess. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So now we're going to get into selecting just a single element. So we've been talking a lot about like single single brackets a uh, bunch, but now we're going to introduce our double brackets and our dollar and the dollar sign. There's additional operators for subsetting. You typically use them. Um, I mean, you can use them right extracting items from a vector, but you'll probably typically use them more with like lists and data frames. Um, so in this case, we have a list uh, with three elements. Um, one with just you know the integers uh, one through three. Another one. Um, with the character vector A, and then another one uh, with a vector uh, four through six. Um, when you're using single brackets on a list, so let's say I just want the first element of this list X, this returns another list. So maybe that's not what you want, or maybe it is, um, but we'll get to that in a sec. Um, so that just returns the first element of the list, but it's also a list, even though like that element isn't a list, which is kind of weird. Um, but let's say maybe I wanted a slice, so you can do some slicing also with lists, um, obviously the same stuff you can do with vectors. Um, so in this case, I just want the first two elements of this list returned as a list. Um, so you can do that. And I guess also even like to, you know, kind of state that a lot of these subsetting rules, I think, as we're sl slowly starting to see um, that, you know, we were talking about with vectors equally applied you know, lists and data frames. So once you really get nailed down that logic of how do I like subset a vector, it's like pretty easy then to generalize that's like more complicated data structures, right? Like lists and uh, data frames. Um, now, oftentimes maybe I don't want a, like a list, right? I want the element that's in that list, whatever that element could be. It could be another list, it could be a vector, it could be a model, right? It could be a data frame. Um, in this case, if I want the actual first element of a list and I do not want it to return as a list. I want to return whatever um, is in it. Um, you use double brackets. In this case, I'm saying, hey, I want the first element in the list and don't return this as a list, right? I wonder whatever that data structure is. Um, in this case, right, it returns the integer vector uh, one through three. Um, this is one thing I've seen before. And I guess what's kind of my I don't know if it's just something maybe I know it'll never happen, but like I feel like should be changed in base R. Um, 
Hadley, right, he, he makes like a little note at, uh, at the end of this saying that you should always use uh, double brackets when even like you're working with vectors um, because it makes it more clear to the reader and also like to you maybe a couple of weeks down the line when you're looking back at some analysis um, that you are selecting one element um, from a vector. So Hadley doesn't, you know, let's say you loop through some vector X, right? And you just like had some output vector and you're applying some function to it. Um, he doesn't recommend that you use single brackets, even though out in this case is a regular old plane atomic vector. He recommends you use um, double brackets just to kind of, again, signal that you are extracting one element. Um, thought that, you know, that was interesting. Um, I, I do kind of, I, I guess I wonder, I guess you could always like test to see like whatever object you're working with to make sure there aren't any like weird errors <laughs> depending on the subsetting, but. It's, I guess it's like one of those things, right, with like base R where you sometimes just wish that there was like kind of just like one way to either do it, right, um, instead of having like two ways and, but also with both of those ways can still apply to like regular vectors and it's sometimes kind of weird. Um, but yeah, that's kind of was what Halley recommends. I don't know if anyone else had similar takeaways that was weird, but I just thought it was weird. <laughs> yeah, I... Um... It's funny, like I know I never think about that because I do like write functions where like or, or like code where like I, I I extract the single bracket thing and then I never remember it until like months later and I go Jesus maybe like that thing I wrote you know a couple months ago was wrong but then I check and it's not so yeah <laughs> no for sure um, cool and then uh, this one you know dollar sign probably all use this when we're working with, uh, with data frames. It's just a shorthand for, uh, you know, double brackets. So let's say I had some uh, data frame X and I wanted the column Y from it. I can just do X dollar Y grabs me that column, um, which is, you know, a bit shorter and a bit easier to write than doing like X double bracket and then string uh, Y. Um, and obviously th this also applies with lists. Actually, this is a weird behavior with lists. So X, right? X, ha X only has an element, it's named ABC. Now, what if I do X dollar A, it returns one. And the reason for that, it is also, that's, I don't know why they decided to do this, um, is that dollar, the dollar sign will do partial string matching from left to right. So in this case, um, you sh and obviously that's confusing, right? Where uh, in this case, there's only, I'm gonna just call these keys, because uh, I'm thinking of like Python dictionaries, but um, there's a key ABC in this list X. Right, and if I do X dollar A, you would think that should just fail. There isn't a key in this uh, list X called A. There's a key called ABC, but the reason it does doesn't is because R will say, "Hey, I think this is what you were trying to do." Um, so it will return um, the element right at ABC one, but that's not what you want, um, which is kind of like a weird design behavior. I can't necessarily think of a reason why, unless you were just like really that lazy of typing. Um, I thought but, exactly the same thing. I was like, cause you know, we're sitting here saying, oh, you know, don't, don't subset on factors and all these things about don't, don't, don't engage in things that will lead to unexpected behaviors. Well, yeah. I guess since we're talking about it, this, what you said that, you know, the, the partial matching is, is where is it, we, I mean, we, it's not unknown behavior, but it's like, why, why, why do that? You know, I, yeah, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Well, I, I, mean, like, I mean, it's like, it just seems like it's, it seems like the, the, the potential dangers are so much, although, you know, I'm, I say this not being a computer scientist. So I guess, um, yeah, maybe, maybe there is this like need for partial matching. But. Yeah. Like I, I would love, yeah. I'd be curious to like understand like why that was made. If like anyone even knows, I, I know it didn't say in the book, but one no. way where you can just, and you can just, you know, say, Hey, um, they can turn on these options. Uh, so just warn when you're doing like a partial match. So if I then do one oh, yeah. clue, one clue might be that it also does this partial matching on function arguments where it is kind of handy, right? You can just use a letter, you know, shorter letter as long as a shorter name for the, the function optional argument. So it must yeah, be, I, a part of, I wonder if it's yeah, the same but... mechanism as it being played with it being used in both cases. Yeah, I guess it's just. I think the, it is the, the same whole... mechanism. Yeah, it is the same mechanism. There's an environment, right? And you're evaluating yeah. this thing in an environment. And if you, internally, it's using the dollar size thing, probably. So that might be why this one can support that function partial match. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. That's just. I don't a know. Guess. Just, yeah, I, I guess. I guess. 
maybe I'm just being like overly conservative and like a fuddy duddy, but it's kind of like when, you know, so much of, I, I just noticed people who are, you know, programmers and developers and, you know, and, and we're seeing it in this book, there's so much warning about unexpected behaviors. And yeah. it's like, why would you build something in that? I mean, I understand that you're right. It's, it's for convenience and stuff like that, but maybe there's like two like things. Maybe yeah. there's two. Maybe there's two partial matches that we just that we're not aware of when we do the partial match. You know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, it's like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah it's, I, it's a design what, failure yeah. in my view. Because if if you look at the way programming languages are going, everybody's going the opposite way, right? Rust and all these languages are going the opposite way. More strictness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't I mean, let people like, shoot the sauce of the foot by. Yeah, because I mean that should arguably fail. It's just like you know, I could totally say it where it's like you're writing out something quickly, right? You're like you make a mistake. Everyone makes like the stupid yeah. little typo type mis mistake, right? And maybe you like select the wrong column and this should yeah. be like, hey, this is an error. It should fail loudly. Exactly. Um, don't, yeah, don't, don't, don't reward that behavior. Yeah. Like, you know, wake that behavior up or like wake the person up from that behavior. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, um, there's a reason, there's, uh, no, undoubtedly there's a reason from, from Hadley and others that are much <laughs> smarter than us. So I just want to yeah. get that on the, the record that I'm not questioning anybody's um, No, no, exactly. Um, you can, and uh, with options, you can just um, turn it, turn it, uh, you can make it now throw a warning. So if I do, you know, <laughs> X dollar A, it'll, it'll still return the number, right? In this case, it'll still return it, oh, still work. Um, but it will warn you. So I guess better than nothing, I, maybe there's, I don't I'll know if there's like on. an environment variable to uh, maybe just error out <laughs> instead um yeah. but it will at least well, warn there you. Is, not... i guess the way to do is never use dollar sign because always use the double brackets but that's kind of a headache too right yeah or just use tibbles which is also a takeaway of this chapter there you just go like, just use the tibbles. Tibbles. Yeah, i love my, i love i love my dollar signs guys. This, is, this, is a, this is probably good advice too. um because like yeah you don't see any of these like weird behaviors right with data frames just make it a tibble and you will not have to like <laughs> yell at your computer um you still can though you still can you'll still you yell about <laughs> other things just not about whether or not you're returning the right data when you're subsetting um this was an interesting little table so i just like converted it from the book um it essentially is saying um what will happen if you are you know let's say i have this atomic vector array. Right? if it's zero length right it will throw an error um if i'm like doing some like indexing or whatnot um if it's out of bounds right if let's say i like i have a vector that's like a link three and i do four it will throw an error same thing if it was like a you know character right error missing error i found lists to kind of annoy me um the only reason is that i feel same. like this should just throw an error because it, if because if it throws like an error right if i like have some list with three elements and i do um, you know, if I do like, right, list A equals one, B equals two, and I do three, right? Good, that should be an error, right? That makes sense, there is only two elements. But then if I do something like C, it will throw null, which is like, that should just be an error, at least to me, right? Because what essentially it's saying, it's, it's like saying, you know, there isn't a key right in this list called C, um, there's only two keys A and B, but instead of like throwing an error saying, hey, this doesn't exist, right? This is like, isn't in the list. It will just return null, which I don't really get why. Um, feel like that should just be an error um, in terms of like, it just to me makes sense um, that it should be an error, especially when you're considering that if you're indexing out of bounds, right? Um, with numbers, it will throw an error. So I don't necessarily understand uh, the reason why it doesn't do that for character vectors. Maybe it's something in how R is designed with that. I don't really know, but just thought that was weird and I didn't really like it. <laughs> but that was like kind of my least thing I at least wanted to mention. There is like at least some weirdness with what I would say, like some weirdness with the behavior of lists um, when you're doing like things like indexing out of bounds in terms of like keys that aren't present in that list. I feel like uh, this I whole think... book should be retitled as Our Weirdness and Other Adventures. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> That anyway, is weird, gosh. though, what you just showed. I didn't realize that was the case, huh? So not only I do it partially match, but it also, if you, even, even if you do use double brackets, it'll still, like, return a null if it doesn't find yeah. that key. Is there a, does, does pluck do that? Or does pluck give an error? No, pluck, right well, pluck, you, select, pluck I mean, you can, um, 
well, select will just throw an error, but like pluck will, um, I think there's a default keyword where it will then like throw an error. Um, oh, okay. So like, it'll have like the same behavior, but then if you do like default and whatever, then it'll just like throw an error um, instead. A, a part of me wants to think that this behavior is like, I think a part of why it throws a null for lists is because lists are used for iteration and function like you can, you can iterate over lists. And so if like a value is not there and, you know, it, it gets into certain situations where you might be iterating over a list. And I don't know if this is the case. And so I'm just, this is a half-baked idea while we were talking. So if this is not the true case, don't take it as, as valid. But like, there are certain situations where you might be trying to iterate over a list and you know, there might like, you know, that in some situations that that piece of that list might be there when you iterate and it might mm -hmm. not be there. And so it's nice to have that null value because if it errors out doing iteration, the whole program stops. It, nothing happens, right? Mm. But if you have a null value that gets returned, you can still have the, that list be iterated over. Yeah. So that would be, would be my guess of why that behavior is there. Honestly, but, that seems kind of plausible, which is, I guess then I would push back, not like on you, because I actually think that makes sense in my head. I guess then I would push back in the sense of like, if you think that's going to happen, then just do like... Um, you know, have like a try or accept, like or try catch, right? Where it's like I should do this, and it, and like if I run into an an area where um this key like isn't present, right? And this like this deeply nested list, just like you know make note of it, um and like keep iterating. But I wonder actually when when you said that, I wonder if it's again what I'm kind of seeing is that there's these like convenience functions out there, right? Um, but then also have like these weird behaviors that might not like are kind of unexpected. Um, like kind of like, right. We were seeing with like the partial dollar match, but that kind of, yeah. Cause I think you're right. You're right. Yeah. Cause it would just, it would just be, it would just throw an error. Right. If I'm like doing the loop or whatever. No, um, you don't do yeah. it. You try to, in R, you try to avoid loops as much as possible because yeah. they're extremely inefficient. So you might prefer just to get these yeah. and deal with them later. Select them Which all it, later. Yeah. Select and I later. wonder, if that's also the thing too, it's like, cause you compared to like, um, like a more general, I hate the term, but I'm just gonna use that. The gen, like a general purpose programming language, really despise the term, but like um, something like Python, right? Where, um, and Python obviously has a lot more like loops and stuff. And you use it probably like, I write more loops at least in my Python code um, with like some stuff that isn't like pandas related. Um, that should like, you know, and that, I guess in that world, right, it should be throwing errors, right? Cause you're using loops a lot more. Whereas in R, as like yeah. you, you said, Ron, right? Where it's like in R and I agree. It's so like when I'm writing R, I typically really don't use loops. And if I need to, I like probably would just like defer to per or something. Um, but oftentimes write a lot of like data analysis stuff. You don't really need loops um, necessarily sometimes, but oftentimes now. Um, so yeah, I guess it, that might just be, yeah, maybe one of those like convenience functions. Um, which honestly, yeah, makes a lot more sense where, but I, I guess I feel like it shouldn't, I don't know, but I, I think, I, I think that makes sense. It, it does seem surprising <laughs> to me though. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Like, well, wait a minute. If that um, was a dictionary in Python, you definitely get a key error, right? So yeah, no, exactly. Like, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like with those, it's like, you know, you just like try and then like accept this and then like you handle the right, that exception, um, at yeah. least is what I would do. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, I think what Colin said at least seems right. I think it seems quite plausible. <laughs> I mean, who knows? I, <laughs> but I, I don't know. It could be something <laughs> totally different, but I just know there's certain situations where like that null is nice to have rather than error. Because mm -hmm. an error is just a hard stop, right? Yep. It's just a straight hard stop. And so your program stops. So Yep. No, for sure. Um, all right. Oh, this is just a quick thing. There, you know, there's the at uh, operator and slot. These are um used in S4 objects. I've I personally have not used them. Um, obviously, I've never really worked with S4, um, but that's something we're going to be talking about in chapter 15. But it's just, and again, there's more subsetting operators, uh, but we're going to get to that, you know, way down the line. Um, so I didn't really focus about it here. Um, they just mentioned it in the chapter. Um, subsetting an assignment. So let's say I have like, you know, general syntax, like have some vector, let's call it X. And I want like to index in certain index index on a certain element and then just like replace that um, that value. So let's say it's an integer vector one through five and I wanted to change uh, the first two values of that uh, vector to 101 and 102. I can just do that pretty simply and you know, easy peasy. Um, 
you can also kind of apply this with lists as well. So let's say I have a list with the elements um, or the keys A and B. Um, if I want to get rid of B, it's like, I don't want you anymore. Uh, you can just um, use double brackets, uh, get the element that you don't want and then assign null to it. Um, so that will then remove the key B from the list. As you can see here, we only now have A. Um, but let's say you wanted to add a literal null. Um, you have to wrap it in list. Uh, you have to wrap the null in, with uh, the list function. So, you know, let's just create another list. And let's say I want to add um, the literal null um, to a new key. I'm going to call it C. Um, just do that. And then it's, act, then it's added. So, you know, I could then do YC and it'll give me, um, give me null. Now that I'm actually wondering, I'm just want to see if, uh, if C will work. Oh no, C will actually just delete it. Uh, and I guess actually that makes sense because um, because of this, right? Like, I don't know. I mean, it would essentially be because everything is a vector in R. So yeah, that, yeah, that makes C sense. C is the same as null. Yep. So it's like C1 is the same as one. Yep. Um, so yeah, C doesn't work, only list. <laughs> um, when you want to add a literal null. And Oh yeah, so this was a cool little application here with um, subsetting with nothing. Um, so you really probably would never really do it. I could see, maybe, maybe there is a scenario in which you do it with like something simpler, like with a vector. But let's say I have um, the, um, the famous empty cars data set, right? Um, that everyone's seen. And I want to uh, turn all of the columns uh, to integer for whatever reason, um, but I want to keep it as a, um, as a data frame. Obviously there are a couple of ways to do that, but um, we can just uh, coerce all of the columns and empty cars um, with as.integer using lapply, right? Looping over all the columns and just converting them to integer. Um, but since we know that um, if you use like the lapply family or the apply family, lapply will return a list. Um, but since if you don't want that, um, you can just um, subset with nothing and that will then keep empty cars as a data frame. And we can kind of actually confirm that is the case. Um, if you don't subset with nothing um, and you use lapply as an integer, it'll return a list. Although obviously like the, the way to then get around that is then just to do something like, you know, as dot data frame, right? And then you can get it back as a, um, as a data frame. Um, and actually, I guess, because if this is, um, Oh, I should check that. I guess what I was thinking in, in terms of like, th if this doesn't like, does this make any copies? Because I guess I, I guess in the sense of like, I would probably never write this, but maybe if it was like a big data frame and I like wanted to do like some manipulation to it and I just want to kind of just do it in, I guess in place. I don't know. Everything is in place unless it needs to make a copy. Yeah, right? no, no, you're right. Yeah. Copy on modify. It's weird. Yep. But yeah. Very different than Panda's way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, that, you know, just a way you could do that. Right. I mean, there are also like tidy ways to do that as well. Um, cool. And then we're just gonna get to the applications of it. Um, I know I'm running a little low on time, so I'll just quickly go through this. Um, so, right. Lookup tables, probably if I'll use them right with data analysis, let's just say I had, um, whatchamacallit, um, let's say I had these list of abbreviations, right. For male, female, or unidentified, um, I could create a, a little look lookup vector, right. Um, that essentially maps M to male, F to female, and U to NA, right? Missing. Um, and, you know, you can just have like this vector, uh, this lookup table, right? So the lookup table, right, just looks like this, just a name vector, again, mapping the elements we see in X to um, those new values. And then I could just subset uh, with it. So I can take my lookup table, you can then subset with the vector X, and then boom, it does like all the replacement for us um, for all of these. Um, this was, I don't know about you guys, this didn't make sense to me um, in the sense that like, I think mostly because of like the, the dimensions of it where X is right, it's a vector of length seven, lookup is a vector of length three. And that to me though, is just a bit weird. Um, I guess maybe, it's, I don't know if that's doing anything with vector recycling, but I like wrote out just the, what I thought would maybe kind of be happening uh, just in a for loop. Right, so I'm just like looping over, um, right, this vector. I'm just like, has some like output vector um, that just combines that output, right, um, to whatever is in the lookup table. And 
you know, it's the same, same type of deal. Um, but that just made a bit more sense to me. Um, cause I guess I don't, for some reason, it just isn't like clicking in my brain, like why this should work. Um, <laughs> subsetting into like look up and then subsetting into X. Um, I don't know if you guys had any takeaways on that or if it did make sense to you, but to me it didn't. So I like wanted to write out the loop and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, that if I think about it that way, then it makes more sense. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, obviously I feel like you'd also just do stuff like if else or case when, or um, like I can think of like pandas, you can do like map, um, which like will actually in this case, like map, like whatever, uh, essentially like a dictionary, right? So um, like M to male, F to female, so on and so forth. Um, then you can also with subsetting, uh, another application would be, you know, matching and merging by hand. Um, so let's say I had some vector of grades and I wanted to um, map them to, um, in this case, you know, info about those grades. Uh, I can just use the match function. Match function is pretty cool. So it's saying, hey, um, where, oh shoot, let um, me do everything. Uh, so let me do ID. Um, this will just return, right, like the rows in which this match. So um, in this case, it's saying, hey, who has like grade of one? Uh, like what row? The three, and then you, you know, just follow suit um, with all of those. Um, this is really though, and I mean, the book mentions it too, this is like probably just easier to do with a join, right? Because these are, you can essentially treat these as keys. Um, so if you wanted to, to make it a bit more clear, I think what's happening, um, you can essentially just convert grades to a tibble um, and that you can just think of as a key as a key. And then you can just uh, left join grades to info, right? And you get the same exact, um, same exact thing. Um, so it's just kind of, I don't know, you can, it's really just a, a join. <laughs> it's, it's nothing too, too bad. Um, then, you know, you can also do uh, with subsetting, you do some random samples and bootstraps. So we have some data frame uh, over here, right? Just some like values. Um, and you want to like randomly reorder the rows, right? So obviously this is like applications for stuff like uh, machine learning, right? You want to like shuffle the rows in your um, data set before you uh, split into training and test sets. Um, again, this to me, when I first looked at it, I'm like, this should fail because um, right, n row will just return like whatever that integer is, in this case, like five um, for this data frame. But I looked at the documentation and that if the first element in the sample, which is like the number of times, like um, like the, the vector I want to sample from, um, if it's greater than or equal to one, <laughs> well, if it's of length one, oh, sorry, if it's x is numeric and um, it's greater than or equal to one, sample will just create an integer vector from one through X. So in this case, it will create an integer vector one through five, and then it'll do the sampling. And then that makes a little bit more sense. Um, so yeah, that this to me shouldn't have worked, but then when I looked at the documentation, I'm like, okay. So really another big theme is just base R is weird and has some like weird things that you sometimes have to look up because again, that to me should fail, but that's just right. Randomly uh, reshuffles the uh, rows in a data frame. Um, with also with sampling, let's say I want to not only shuffle, um, randomly shuffle the rows in a data frame, I only want the first three rows. You just add in um, how many samples you want to draw from that reshuffle data frame. So in this case, I just want three, returns the first three rows, right, uh, randomly. Um, and then bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is like, a, I know a bigger thing in uh, random forests, right? When you want to like kind of, and also just like a general statistical technique. It's obviously not just, um, necessarily only in random forests. Um, but you can just do, right, bootstrap is just sampling with replacement. So all you do is um, you're saying, hey, I want to shuffle, right, all of the rows in the data frame. I want uh, six samples back, but I want to do uh, with replacement, right? So it's then possible, right, that you can get like the same row n number of times. Um, and that's just, and do we do it? Yeah, so in this case, right, we get like um, one, one, of, one such row, or actually two. Um, that are repeated. So that's just, you know, bootstrapping. And again, you know, we're using um, like just single brackets, right, to do the subsetting um, with this. So pretty cool um, that you can just, you know, something as like when we were, I think, initially talking about just like, oh, you can just like index and do all of these things that like actually has more powerful applications um, that you'd like probably do in a more like working with real world data. 
Um, all right, ordering and ordering is pretty simple. So ordering, let's just say I want to like sort this, um, this vector, right, BCA alphabetically. Um, order will just return the indices uh, that will do that. So um, if I do order X, it will say, okay. Um, okay, I got to, hey, I, sorry about that. I got to oh. run, uh, I'll catch the end of this on the video and see you guys next time. Yeah, I think this is, I think, I think we're probably, cause we're already five over. Yeah. Um, so I think it was probably a good like stopping point. I mean, we could catch up with this next, we could pick up cause we only have like what, maybe three or four more examples. Yeah, it, I think, yep. And I think it'd probably be beneficial so that we're, that we actually, um, so that instead of just kind of briefly touching on them, you know, next week, probably like, uh, like catch up with this and then take the time to kind of go through the rest of the examples. Um, I think that'll be beneficial rather than trying to stuff it in like the next 10 minutes or something. So, yeah. Um, and plus chapter five, isn't that long. So we'll have <laughs> plenty of time to cover the rest of them. So, um, I really appreciate, uh, I really appreciate Rob, Robert, you taking the opportunity to kind of share kind of the first parts of this. And it really kind of clarified some things for me. Um, certainly oh, <laughs> yeah, it did. It, it did. Some of the stuff was, was, uh, was great to see. Um, oh, it looks like, um, I think, so, I think it's just us. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm like talking like as a whole group, but yeah, I really appreciate it. I think what we'll do for the people that are going to catch up um, where we're at, uh, we'll finish up with the final three, four examples, and then we'll go to control flow next week. And then I think Ryan said he would take that. So cool. that's, uh, that's, that's excellent. So, and then we'll go into functions after that. So I really awesome. appreciate you doing that. I really no, appreciate you covering that so far. No, of course. Yeah. Sorry again with the issues with Zoom. Um, said so that was me to finish. And I was like, oh no. I'm like, I totally should. I'm like, I downloaded Slack. I got my things ready, but I'm like, wait, shit, I didn't download Zoom. And I'm like, oops. <laughs> it, it's all right. It's it's cool. It's like one of those things where it's like you just always run into hiccups. So yeah. <laughs> how, how do you like using VS Code for um <laughs> it's taken a little bit of time? So like uh I think the my big forcing function with it is um, I use GitHub Copilot. Um, oh, nice! Yeah. It's it's so cool. Like I, it it does save some time uh, when you're writing code, um, and it's obviously like I, I like at work I pretty much only use Python only because like Mandry uses it. Um, also, even like in general, I don't know. I've noticed my style has definitely shifted more towards Python. I think I just like it more as a language, which was not the case like even like a few months ago, um, I was like very annoyed when I had to use Python. Um, mm -hmm. But for some reason, it's just started to click better in my brain um, compared to R. Um, but it's still really nice to use, I think, in VS Code. It definitely is not as first class as I would say like R Studio. Um, like yeah. there's some stuff with like indentation that I kind of find a little bit weird. Um, I do like the console. Um, it's this other like open source one called Radian. Um, I do like it. It, it seems like it's pretty nice. Um, but there are like some, there is some stuff I do miss from our studio that I don't really get here. Um, but also the thing is, is that I'm really using Python most of the time, at least for work. So it's kind of one of those things where yeah, this is fine. I mean, to me, I think like uh, part of the reason why I'm like doing this is I think there are like some very cool aspects in R that I would love to like maybe apply more in like Python, just like yeah. in like my day-to-day -day stuff. Like I write Python definitely way differently because I know R, um, mm -hmm. even like I'm like working with pandas and pandas can be, you know, I know it, it gets its fair share of, uh, let's call it hate, <laughs> its fair <laughs> share of hate. Um, but even like applying like ideas of like method chaining where, um, which is just piping right from R, like we all know what piping is, um, you can apply mm -hmm. that in Python and it actually makes them like working with like pandas data frames way better. And just like taking those, I think like ideas from like one programming language and then like, you know, trying to see, can this maybe fit in like the language I'm using? I think it's like valuable. And even if not, like, it's always, you know, cool to kind of like look at like a language and understand like the decisions it makes um, or decisions like that were made um, by the people who designed it um, and like how it works and what's good at, what it's bad at. Um, what it's yeah <laughs> yeah I think um because I actually I, I switched to um I use uh I use an open source IDE called NeoVim 
and making the switch to a different IDE after working in our studio for so long, you start re- you start noticing like some of the stuff that you didn't know, and you actually learn a lot more about yes. the language because you because there's just so many conveniences that are afforded to you in our studio, and you're just like they're just there, right? Yep. And then like when you switch your IDE, you start realizing like some of the nuances that are there that like you're just like oh like. I learned this thing right here because it's telling me this IDE version is telling me like something's wrong with it and stuff. And so you're just like, Oh, you learn more about the language and like how it's written and stuff. No, so, exactly. Yeah. So and it's I, also I could, like, Oh, sorry. Ahead, yeah. No, go no. Ahead. Oh. <laughs> I think it's also, um, I noticed, especially like my work where it's, um, Oh God, I hated like the context switching where it was just be like, Oh, I go to this IDE, I go to that IDE. So I'm like, I can just throw everything in VS code and GitHub po- copilot is lovely. And, you know, just like, it took a little bit, but then just literally just trying to move everything into VS code the best that I can. Um, just like, I think saves a lot of time of, oh, I'm writing some SQL here. I can just do it in VS code. I'm writing some Python here. I can just do it in VS code. And then if I can keep everything at least the best I can, into one place, then I can minimize, right, that annoyance of, like, going from IDE to IDE, shifting data from here, and, like, ah, that's awful. <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I think that's the that's the big thing. I think it's just, like, that context switching is, like, oh, I got to write a little bit of SQL. Okay, I got to jump over to another. Yeah, and it just was a pain. So, yeah, yeah I'm, yeah, I, I mean, I, I miss, I miss our studio. Like, there's some things... <laughs> There was a lot of convenience in it, but then there was just like, and then too, like communicating with other people like that are still in our studio, you know, you still have to pop it up to be like, you know, cause they're, that's what they're comfortable with. And so, yep. but like, ever since I've made the switch to a different IDE, you just like it, you see some of the conveniences that are out there for switching. So, and I think a lot more people are probably going to switch to VS code especially with, you know, our studio moving deposit. I don't think our studio is going away. So if people watch this later, I don't yeah. think it's going away. But I think, you know, there's just going to be some more tooling that's going to be provided to Great. people through, through hey, if, uh, VS Code. If they, if they want to make the Python data ecosystem a bit easier to work with, um, I won't complain. <laughs> I will not uh, complain. Um, it's, that, like, yeah. that's the biggest, that, that's just like the biggest hurdle, you know, like, environment management and all that like I mean I could I can stumble through it and I've gotten better about it but like for other people who are like brand new to it like I just like if it was like my first language I learned I think that would be the biggest hang up you know yeah like I I couldn't I mean R is really like the first language I'm like okay I understand how like use this like generally and then I like learned Python and but I feel like without learning R there was no way in hell I was learning Python um, because once you like know how to like, especially with, like data analysis stuff, like once you have like the concepts down, once you understand like this is a for loop, this is control flow, all of that stuff, then it's like, okay, I have those ideas in a language that I would argue is probably a bit easier to get started with. Um, I think I'll actually not an I, a lot of people would argue that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you like go over to something like Python, then it's like, okay, this is way easier um, in terms of like understanding the concepts. But yeah, th- definitely like if you look at like the Pi data stack, it's a bit more it's definitely got a lot better, I will say, um, since even when I used it, it had been undergrad. Um, it's definitely got like a lot more focused, like in terms of like, um, you're working with maybe like different, like X-ray. Um, like I, I've been doing some like Bayesian modeling at work. Um, I convinced my manager to do that. That's always good. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I'm using like PyMC and um, which is like very, yeah, I don't know if you've ever done or heard of it, but um, but it's um, I know like the analog to and like R. I mean, it's like it's like Stan, um, kind of. But you just write all your stuff in like Python. Um, essentially, like all the results like you from your analysis are stored in like what's called an X array data set, um, which is like just in like essentially like a NumPy array or NumPy matrix on steroids because it has like labeling and stuff. But you can like export that to a data frame, right? Um, so it does seem that there are more um packages that are at least like trying to at least integrate more with um like you know a pandas data frame for better or worse right um at least trying to get maybe more cohesion around like a certain set of data structures where i feel like in the past even like a few years ago um depending on maybe you're maybe you're doing like you're plotting in like seaborn but maybe there's like some weirdness right around that with like the data structure you're trying to pass it with or maybe you're doing like some some even stuff like scikit-learn right they were actually at points it was not easy to take your stuff from a an array and then like convert it into a data frame like 
a lot of other applications in R are, right? Where it's like, if I, if I fit some model, I, I can very easily return as a data frame that really wasn't the case even like a few years ago in Python. Um, so, hey, you know, Posit wants to uh, <laughs> put more open source work into that. I'm like, please, <laughs> that would be great. Um, <laughs> Well, that's like, that's the thing is like, I, like I picked up like an introductory, like data analysis, like Python for data analysis or something like some book like that, like focus on that topic. And like the first few chapters, it's like, it's like, you know, it's, it's okay. Okay. But then like chapter, like three, it's like, okay. But then it starts talking about like NLP modeling and like all the data structures that I'm like, I just want to know how to like, I just want to know how to like select a column yeah. and take it away. It's like, why did we jump from like, we jump from like subsetting to like NLP models. And I was just like, like, we don't have how do to I do a group by. <laughs> yeah. Just tell me how to do a group by so I can like build on those foundational things yeah. before we start jumping into like these like big modeling, like, like libraries and everything. I'm like, this is chapter three, like introduce this in like chapter 15 after you've done like the basic like data analysis stuff. But that was just one book. That was one critique yeah. of one book, but I don't know. Cool. Well, I'm going to jump off. So I appreciate you taking this on. Um, and then we'll pick up with next week. We'll, we'll finish up the rest of those examples and then we'll start chapter um, five. So we'll see you next awesome. week. See you next week. Have a good Have rest of your week. Have a good one. Yep. All right, bye. bye.